So I'm just going to pray, and um, if you want to join me, Lord, we just invite you this morning to speak your word. Lord, we just um, submit to you this morning and everything in it. We trust you. We know that you are in control, and we give all control to you, God. And we just thank you that it is only by your spirit that we can do um can do all those things you have called us to do. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we pray that your love would be heard this morning, that it would be received this morning, and that we would leave uh, with a, a, a little bit of something that changes and that bears fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, surprisingly enough, I thought it'd be a really good idea to talk about covenant. So if you haven't heard of that word, um, it's it's a word used for a promise, a vow, those kind of uh, words all are collective with covenant. Um, within the context of the Bible, the covenant, the big greatest covenant, uh, there are many covenants within the Bible, <clears throat> but one of the pronounced ones that we live freely by today is that Jesus came, he died on the cross, and, and that in that was God's covenant that through this act that we would be saved, and we would be healed, we would be delivered, not by our power, not by our might, but by His Spirit. So is a, that is the ultimate covenant. And and when we make a vow to one another in marriage, it is a covenant as well that is sealed with such a, it's it, there's grace attached to it because God loves covenant. He loves covenant, and He loves to show up to, uh, to be able to establish that secure that security and that truth. So I just want to talk about it because it's something that we may have heard of, but um, just in light of this, I just felt we needed to kind of go into it a little bit. So we're going to go straight into it. Um, covenant, the word, actually is a Hebrew word. Ready? I'm going to try and say it. Yes. Brit. <laughs> Bur Brit. Um, I wish I knew Hebrew. That's the coolest language. It's so it's just full of pictures. Um, but Hebrew is a very dynamic language, and and unlike ours, we have different words for different things, quite detailed. But the Hebrew language is actually very foundational. They have a lot of roots to them, and in the root, the meaning of the root is established in the meaning of the words. And so when they spoke, that's why there's a lot of parables or a lot of pictures. So um, the word he, covenant in Hebrew means to select the best. That's pretty cool. I, I think in our culture, there is a lack of really being very selective often. As young people, we get swept up in the emotion of things and we don't often think about, hold on a second, what do I want to be like connected to for forever? This might be good right now, but is this, am I going to, you know, like this when I'm 50 or 60? But to know that this is, when you make a covenant, you're saying, I am selecting the best for me. That's what a covenant is. I am saying out loud to everybody else, this right here is the best for me. And the ultimate covenant is our covenant with the Lord. And I'm saying in front of you all, and we all make that declaration, that you know, when we choose him, we say, I'm selecting you. You are the best. I'm selecting the best. That's my covenant. I'm saying you are the best, and I'm telling you I commit to um, to you as the best. The next one is to cut an agreement, which actually that cut, can I just sidebar here? Actually in the Hebrew culture, you know what they used to do way, way back yet, when in the Old Testament? They used to actually, when they made a covenant, they would cut up a calf and they would separate it and they would walk through it. <laughs> They're so intense. Like, when you look back at that culture, they're always so intense, but they're very like, I mean it. And they would walk through this cut calf, and they would say, I am standing on this agreement, this covenant that I made, or let me become like that calf. That's what they're... Anyway, sidebar. So... Um, but in that, that's where that to cut an agreement comes from in, in the Hebrew culture. We're cutting an agreement. I'm saying, I'm, this is, can I wrap it all up in this? It's when we make a covenant, we make an agreement with ourselves and with that person that I will not quit. Yeah. 
That's it. And it, I know there are circumstances. I'm not going to go into the many circumstances we can come into. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to shame people and tell people, oh, well, if you've been divorced, then, you know, or if you've been separated, that is not what this is about. So we're not even going to go there because that's a whole other message. But what I am saying is this, in the moment when we make a covenant, our hearts need to be set that I will not quit. Okay, there are times maybe, and we're going to use Dana Monique a lot right now because this is about this right now, is there are times for a break. There are times for separation maybe. There are times for uh, renewal. There are times for refreshing. There are times for maybe allowing people to come in and speak into areas you need help with. There's times for growth. All of those are real. And But what the heart posture is, is I'm not going to quit on you. I'm not going to quit on me, and I'm not going to quit on us. And in doing so, it actually allows yourself to be confronted in areas to actually shift some things in your own heart. Otherwise, what we tend to do, especially in our culture these days, if we don't like it, we leave it. I don't like it. I'm going to leave it. I don't like this job. I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to go get another job. And really, in our culture, there's a lot of the, I don't like it, I'm just going to leave it. And, it. and it's kind of developed this, we're just okay with our flaws and our difficulties, and we just want to start over because that part was fun. I don't want to go to the difficult places. And what this preaches is go to the difficult places because in it is your salvation, in it is your freedom, in it is your hope, and in it is healing. So, you know, when we pray for healing, sometimes we go, Lord, heal me, and we don't realize, just wait a couple of years and then look back. It's, it'll happen. But we want it like that instant, you know, like a Big Mac. And uh, we were looking for prime rib. So um, this is, I just want to blink at this for a second. So honor, I just want to talk about honor. I did talk about this before. If you want to go back and look for the message, you can. Honor is honesty, fairness, integrity in your actions and in your belief. So in your belief system and in your actions, you're honest, you're fair, and you're in, you have integrity. To look upon it um, and deal with someone as a valued individual. You don't just look at their flaws and, and determine that's who they are based on their flaws. You look for the value within them, the thing that you were, you were drawn to to begin with. That's honor. It's to give weight. And we need to submit wisely. We need to be, we need to be wise in how we submit to, uh, to those people. So submit, to present for consideration or judgment. The Greek is, we talked about this, hypotasami. I mean, think you can just think hippopotamus, yeah. Uh, and that is actually to deploy yourself in support of your spouse against the enemy. That is what submit is. To submit yourself is to say, I am for you, I've got your back. When you're facing depression, I got your back. I'm not going to stab you in the back. I'm going to actually, and, and here's the picture, is, you know, you talk about the armor of God. You know, you got the helmet, you got the chest plate, you got the belt, you got the, sh the shoes, the feet are covered. You've got the shield and you've got a sword. Everything is in front. You know, that you're left vulnerable in the back. Why? So when we join ourselves together, we come back to back and we're covered. So I got your back. I'm going to go after things in prayer. I can't, I know men especially, but also women, we like to solve our spouse's problems. We like to try and like, well, all you have to do is, well, why don't you just, but really we, we don't understand really the power of prayer. We need to go into the place of prayer and say, okay, Lord, we need you right now. And I'm going to battle in behalf of you. And that's what the actual word submit looks like. Submit means to go to war for that person and to actually um, battle on their behalf. They're on the same team as is one of the greatest battles we have. It's to support, to deploy yourselves in support of, to arrange yourself for battle. Um, so in light of this, now we're going to read uh, one of our popular verses for marriage, and that's in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 22, and I'm just going to roll through this. So, wives, submit. Now we know what submit means. Submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. 
Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. There's also a layer of the word submit that is to submit. So what does that look like? It looks like when I'm going through a process and I'm processing something, I'm going to submit it to my husband. I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily ask for his permission. That's different. Although I care very much what he has to say, I'm going to submit it to him. This is what I'm thinking. What do you see? And he may see something totally different. So in submitting, I'm going to actually say, I have to take what he says in honor with value. I put value in what he has to say. And so I honor him and I submit to him and then I receive to him. That is what that looks like practically. Okay. Um, 25, husbands. I always say, women, you have to submit. Women, you have to submit. Women, you have to submit. Women, submit. You know, and actually a lot of men have used that to their advantage. You need to submit to me. It says so in the Bible. Don't do that. That's like spiritual abuse. That's not okay. <laughs> we need to void that from our mouth. And we need to realize that there is also a, a call to the men. And what is it? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I think honoring is much easier if we really want to separate and say, well, women do this and men do that. But when he says, love your wives to husbands, is that saying to women, oh, but you don't have to. You're just honoring. Women, you honor. Men, you love. Like we've got two different roles. Is that what it's saying? It's not saying that. Can we actually just back up for a second? We're going to go to the verse 21. That's the one, the verse right before it. And we're going to just read this out in light of what it's saying. What does it say? Is it up there? Submit, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Some versions say submit one to another. You submit to her. She submits to you. It's a yes, both and. You submit, you love. I submit this to you. What do you think? I don't think like you. You know, we are doing personality traits. Dane's the pioneer. He's the dreamer. He's the, let's do it, spontaneous, let's go. And Monique, what was yours again? Unwavering. She's the unwavering one, which who can agree with those two <laughs> descriptions for them? That, you know, she's the one that's going, well, we have to think of this and we have to think of that. Well, we can butt heads doing that, but actually the way it was meant to submit one to another and honor and love one another is actually to bring a compliment to each other and to actually say, I value what you have to say. And when you go in that way, you're not fighting against each other. Say, well, who's right and who's wrong then? Well, if you're saying that, you're saying I'm wrong. Well, no, that's actually not what she's saying. But you think it's option one. She thinks it's option two, but the Lord has you going in option three. And the way to get to option three is actually to submit one to another, to value both of your, your input, and to come to the conclusion, a godly conclusion, together. And this all seems very difficult to do, but it's not if we do it in the right light. Okay, we're going to, um, so there is more on that. I encourage you to read that. I'm not going to go through the whole passage. But um, it talks about loving, and this is the big one, verse 28, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. If you love your wife, he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as a Christ does the church. It's a selfless act. To be in a, a marital relationship, you've got to develop selflessness. You can't be fully selfish and have a flourishing relationship. You can still push through, well, we're not quitting and we're going to, that's good. But in a lot of cases, sometimes it's destructive if you're just not quitting, but you're unwilling to actually shift and move together and, and learn how to work together and to come together in love and selflessness and weed out that selfishness. Good, solid, um, fulfilling uh, blow your mind relationships are those where it's it's not one person wanting and trying to get from the other. It's one person trying. It's like an outgiving match. It's like no, I want to give to you, and that's when real love starts to pour out because that's what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Read the passage. But here's the good news, and this is the in light of this this covenant that you are you are you're renewing the covenant that is already in place. And I, I, I know it's been look, it looks really bad for a while, but you guys didn't quit. Both of you. Neither of you quit. You had every opportunity to quit. And, and it's not that you didn't have boundaries to say, if this isn't going to go in this direction, I'm not going in that direction. I can't go there with you. So there was a line, and that's really important. 
there's a line to make, but it's the, the not quitting means you're going to do everything you can do. And everyone has their choices. There's two choices to each side. I'm going to stand here and do whatever I can do, but I'm also going to stay safe in the process. So the good news is this. Jesus sacrificed himself for us, which was the truest act of love, and we need to love our spouses with the same amount of love as Jesus loved us and the church he saved. And so here's the point, is we can only love our spouse as much as we actually can learn to love the one who created it. Where did love come from? Science can't prove it. Science can't, can't describe love. Love is, I mean, by, 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 I would say everyone in here has a faith that love exists, even though you can't see it, feel it, taste it. You know it's there, though. You know it. By faith, you know it's there. By faith, I know the Lord has created that love, because where else could it have come from? Man did not create that. It's not a product that you can put together and just, I made love. That is something that is so deep within our spirit and within our soul that is so unexplainable, and it comes from an unexplainable place. And we need to connect to that unexplainable place in order to be able to actually do it well. We cannot let the world tell us what love looks like because it is messed up. Truly messed up. There are many different beliefs out there as to what love is, but the only true foundational truth of love is here, and I've seen it played out. I've seen people shift their lives and go, I'm going to do it this way, and I've seen their lives transform into what Ephesians says, exceedingly more abundantly than you could hope or imagine. We're sitting in complacency, being okay with the way things are, not realizing he has better for you. And for your family, your children and your children's children, you put in the effort right now in the hard things and lean into those hard conversations, lean into that difficulty, and it bears fruit in your life and it brings about amazing things. The new covenant is with the Lord. And this is what I want to really, this is kind of the crescendo, I guess you would call it, is that in that vow to one another, that is a, that is a secondary vow between Dana and Monique is the secondary vow. The vow that they have made is first with the Lord. And that's actually when things shifted for their relationship. Monique was all about Dane and trying to get, you know, and I want him and I can't live without him. And I, you know, and then Dane's all about Monique and I, you know, and this is what I need and this is what I want. And, and, and that's, that's kind of where the, the relationship was based out of. And when it actually started to heal was when they, they were like this, they weren't together. They had to learn to live without each other and to, to experience the joy of life without and to engage and encounter the living God and experience his love, which is what happened for both of them. They both had to have that encounter with, with true love to come back to a place where there's, there's such a transformation and such a difference in the way that they come into it. Because 1 John 4, 8 says this, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. We need to know him. It's a personal relationship with the one who really knows how to love. He's our teacher. He's the one that teaches us how to do it. It's too hard on our own. Oh, I just need to be, you can't. You need to be encountered with, with the living God. So in, as we're renewing vows this morning, as you two are renewing vows, there's a couple things happening. There's a renewal of, of, of a promise to one another, but there's also a renewal of a promise in, in light of what God is doing and what God, who God is and those attributes coming in and bearing fruit in their lives. And, and that's through communion. That's how we renew. We need to renew our vows all the time. This is kind of a, a moment, but there's going to be in their moments together, there's going to be times where it's going to be rough and it's going to be tough. And they need to renew that vow in their hearts and say, no, I'm going to do the hard thing so that we can get through this and move forward. I'm going to, I'm going to do the hard thing. And that's the same with the Lord. We need to do the hard thing. We need to renew our minds. That's what communion is. Lord, I'm in. I'm, re I'm just, I'm in. Even unto death, I'll even give you my life. Like, up to my, I treat you like my own body. That's what love is. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. Repentance. How important is repentance in a marriage? If you are not learning the value of repentance and coming with a repentant heart to your spouse, 
to the Lord, it's really hard to keep connection. That connection is really difficult. That's where those little things come in, the little foxes, and they steal because you're holding offenses against one another. And how important it is to come up to one another and just say, listen, that was out of bounds. I shouldn't have said that. You know, I shouldn't have said it like that. I, I was upset. I was tired. I'm really sorry you got in the way of that, you know, and whatever it is. How important is that to write your heart and bring it back into a place where you're now back to back again and you're going the right direction and you're not fighting each other? Um, and we just keep recommitting. We recommit, recommit. So I want to, I want to, I want to read you this and then I'm going to uh, say a quick prayer over you. Um, I'm going to read out of Song of Songs, chapter 8. And this is actually written in light of our relationship with God. This is actually what it's written out of, although it is also very much parallel to our relationship with our spouse. And it's a, it's a declaration. So, this is this is us speaking to the Lord. So this is this is starting in cha uh, chapter eight, verse six, and I'm just going to read it out. It says, "Fasten me upon your heart as a seal of fire forevermore. This living, consuming flame will seal you as my prisoner of love. My passion is stronger than the chains of death and the grave, all consuming as the very flashes of fire from the burning heart of God." Place this fierce, unrelenting fire over your entire being. Rivers of pain and persecution will never extinguish this flame. Endless floods will be unable to quench this raging fire that burns within you. Everything will be consumed. It will stop at nothing as you yield everything to this furi furious fire until it won't even seem to you like a sacrifice anymore. And that's the beauty of love is that when you start to actually engage with the true act of love, it starts to not feel like a sacrifice. It's actually a beautiful exchange that begins to happen and it actually ignites something you've never experienced before. And what I hope to do is put a little bit of a, of a, of a teaser for you in that you can actually experience a deeper love than you've experienced. You can experience a deeper connection and love than you've ever known. And it first does begin with the one who created it. And he calls us, says, my sheep hear my voice. He's always calling to personal relationship. And, and, and it's all about that. That's why he sent Jesus to begin with. And that's all he was about was connection and being with you. So doing the deeds and just checking your boxes is not what it's all about. It's about connecting with the one who created everything. He created what we're looking at right now. He created the ones you love. He created the ones you hate. He created everything. And he is everything. And out of that flow rivers of living water as he flows through. And here's the, here's the promise. It's not that it won't be difficult. And it's not that there aren't going to be times when it hurts. But it's that you have someone, someone, a person, really. He is so real. I don't know if you've ever had this happen. You're just looking for him and you just, oh, I don't even know where to go. And you flip something open and you're like, oh my gosh, like it's speaking directly to, it's not accidents. When I opened up my Bible and I'm crying because I'm like, Lord, I see the youth and I see them struggling and I'm just trying to, da, 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 and, and then I'm like, I just need to hear you. And I open up my Bible randomly and, and there's a prayer for the youth of the future looking, staring at me. I start bawling. I'm like crying and my tears are pouring out of my face. I'm like, oh my gosh, you hear me and you know me. And my tears are dropping on my Bible. One, two, three. And I'm like, oh no, my Bible. Like I'm wrecking my Bible. And I look down and where every tear dropped, the word water was there. And the waters gushed forward. And the water, like he is real people. I can tell you 500 stories like this where it's not just, well, I don't know. That was probably a coincidence. No, I'm telling you, he is real and active. He wants to move in your life. And when you're, when I'm crying, because yes, in fact, my husband and I have disagreements and argue, 
And when we're in this argument, and I feel all hope is lost, and I'm like, there's no hope, he'll never understand me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, oh, and I just look for him, Jesus, where are you? And I see him, and he looks at me, he's like, hey, you can trust me. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to pray differently. Sorry, I totally lost it there. You know, and then I find reconciliation comes really quickly after, and there's this flow that happens, and we learn from it, and he learned something about me, and I learned something about him, and then we argue another time, and we do the same thing again, but in it, we're growing, and I'm telling you, I love this man more now than I ever did before, and I want to be with him more now, and, and loving him is better, and everything is better. It still sucks sometimes, like legit, but I have the one access that actually gives me strength in all of it. So no matter what happens, if you determine in your heart, no matter what happens, I'm going to continue to turn to you, God, and I'm going to renew that covenant with you. And I'm going to say, yes, you are the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to receive what true love is from you because even our best, best ability at loving pales in comparison to the type of love he wants to teach you. It pales. I think I was pretty good at loving people before. I think I'm going to be much better at it in 10 years because the way things are going, it's looking pretty good. Things don't get under my skin so much anymore. People have their days and I, that's okay. I can still move and function and be joyful and peace. That's what it's meant to be. And that's our prayer for you. So I leave you with this prayer. I leave you all with this prayer. And it's Ephesians 3. And I'm going to read it in the NLT. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how deep, or sorry, how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think. He is able, through his mighty power, that is, we allow to be at work within us, to accomplish infinitely. If you're not seeing infinitely more in the area that you're battling in prayer for, or that you're concerned with, or that you're frustrated with, then what's the missing ingredient? Him, through his mighty power. You need his mighty power, you need his words, you need his direction. Because I know there are things that Monique did that she wouldn't have done in her own strength. And one of it is, you know what? I'm justified, I'm done. Bye-bye. And now we're sitting here and we're looking and we're seeing that in his way, in the way he told her to do it, and in her obedience to do it in his likeness, there is a promise fulfilled today that we get to enjoy together as a family. And let this be a testimony to your life. This promise that was promised to Monique in dreams and in visions, God gave her dreams to show her, this is where we're going, trust me. And in that promise that took three years to accomplish and looked worse than it ever had at times. But in trusting him in the process, we sit here today with a new covenant, with a refreshing in a way that it was never before. This is exceedingly more abundantly than they could hope or imagine. And we get to join in with you guys and we're celebrating that with you today. Mm -hmm.